like keys are to the glory days at the stick. From who's got it better than us to brick by brick. It's always the 49ers way from off season to game day. Yeah, we talk back. It's the 49ers cut back. It's 49ers Cutback Podcast time. Welcome to the show. We have lots of news to get into as Alex just got ready for business as the hat went backwards. I mean, you can you can see that. Look at all the business over there. Look yeah. at that. Ready to roll. Yeah, there's lots of stuff to get into. Uh, oh, I'm ready to get into it. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. ready too. First and foremost, Ant. Yeah. Let's talk about what the heck is going on with Dre Greenlaw because ESPN came out with some, uh, I guess the best way to put it is some in- interesting things there about Dre Greenlaw. Naming him an under the radar trade candidate this offseason. Um, while he was dealing with a lot of injuries, they said he has shown consistently time and time again how well of a linebacker uh, he is alongside Fred Warner. And even when Fred Warner is out at times, you know, he he's shown how how good he is. Um, but he's gonna end up costing some money. And he's gonna be a 2023 free agent. He's played well enough that teams are probably going to be willing to give up mid to late round picks in order to get him and acquire him. And that maybe the Niners who are pressed up against the cap and, you know, have already budgeted for Nick Bosa and Debo Samuel, that maybe this is an option. Do you currently see it, that being the case? Um, you know, we you know we got Aziz coming in on, on free agency this off season, and then we're going to have a free agency special talking about him and the other linebackers. Uh, you know, would the Niners consider moving off of Dre Greenlaw to roll with a, a Fred and Aziz combination there? in the second level at the linebacker spot. No. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. Uh, the reason is, is because I, you've seen the difference in the defense when Dre Greenlaw's on the field. Dre Greenlaw makes an instant impact, and he's better in coverage than Aziz Alshire. Uh, Alshire is a good player. I mean, don't get me wrong. I really like him, and I like that linebacking group together. Um, but Kyle Shanahan said what he said at halftime of the NFC Championship game. If we don't have Dre Greenlaw, it's going to make it very difficult on us in the second half. They know his value. He is coming off a, a season where he was injured. This probably would have been a Pro Bowl caliber season for him if he would have played all year long. That's how good he is. He doesn't miss tackles. These guys have high value. You don't just move off them for a mid-round pick. Um, if somebody wants to come in and wow the 49ers you know, with a second-round pick or a third-round pick, um, you might consider it, but I don't think so. You see how much better All-Pro Fred is when Dre Greenlaw is on the field. Yep. Those two guys have versatility um, and give you flexibility on defense to do a lot of different things. There's not very many linebackers that can go out there and match up you know, with a running back or you know, with a tight end out in space. And you do see the difference when those two guys aren't on the field together. So um, I don't think this is something they're interested in. In fact, I think this is a, the, uh, the most opportune time to renegotiate with him. Uh, he's coming off an injury. So you're going to hit him at kind of a low point in what his contract could be. Um, you might be able to bring him back for maybe a shorter amount of uh, years, um, but at a friendly cap number. But I think the foreigners would like to retain Dre Greenlaw. And I don't see a future without him. I could be wrong, uh, but I think that he he's one of those guys that you definitely want on this defense moving forward. I agree with you on that. Um, I, I really do. Um, you know, the, the guy who wrote this for ESPN was talking about how the Lions are a team that are desperate for, for guys in the middle of the field to rejuvenate that defense. And they may be willing to give up a second or maybe even a first or a third or something like that in order to try and grab a, a guy like Dre Greenlaw, knowing the Niners are trying to get some cap room and some cap space and things of that nature. Um, my, my only thing is, is that yeah, the, the it's the Fred, it's the Fred Dre dynamic. Um, you, you know them talking about well, Dre has played really well with Fred, and inverse is also true. Fred has played really well with Dre. Exactly. Um, it's a, it's a yin and yang combination. When the two of them are on the field, they elevate each other's play because they both do s- things so well in certain areas of the game that allows their strengths to shine. Um, it allows the other one to not be afforded to have to cover ground and, and make up for the lacks lack of uh you know maybe discipline or or intensity or or vision, IQ, understanding, being able to come up in space and tackle. Uh, Dre is a surefire t- fire tackler, which means Fred's not worried about, you know, hey, if I put Dre in a one-on-one situation, he may not come away with, with a tackle here. You know, maybe I need to give a little bit of help. Maybe I shouldn't be so aggressive here filling this gap and filling this hole and coming up and stuffing this run here in this spot. And maybe I need to give him a little bit of help. Maybe I need to be here just in case. Didn't have that feelings with Dre Greenlaw. And Dre Greenlaw doesn't have those feelings for Fred Warner, uh, which means they're able to play at their best, their peak, without uh, worrying about trying to cover for one another. It's do my job because I know my boy over there is going to do his. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't want that. I don't want any world where that is the case, yeah. Ant. Um, and I do think this is the right time where, you know, with everything that happened to Dre this year and him not being on the football field, 
Um, you know, and him coming back and fighting through the injury and then getting re-injured again in the NFC Championship game, it's not that his value is low. It's just that with the injury, you don't have to pay him necessarily near as much as you would have had to if he had put together the season you and I both think he could have put together had he been on the field for 17 full games in the playoff run. So strike while the iron's hot if you're the 49ers. You're going to be moving off of Jimmy's contract. You're going to have some additional money. You're going to have some guys you can re-sign. Um, you're going to be able to do some cap gymnastics and move some things around in order to get this guy and keep this guy here. Get it done. Now is the time to do it. Um, let's keep Dre around. I don't want to see him going somewhere else. Yeah, I think that you know if he would have came out and had the Pro Bowl season that everyone anticipated, then probably we gone. would be talking about him getting you know a, a lot of trade value. Um, but I think that you you want to keep this guy around because number one, the big improvement from the twenty twenty one defense from the years past was the run defense, and Aziz Alshair did a really good job in that department. Whereas Aziz Alshair struggled though was in the pass game. That's why when you seen to get into the playoffs, it wasn't Drake Greenlaw that was off the field. Remember there was a big conversation during the season. Is it going to be Dre? Is it going to be Aziz? Yeah, 49er fans were all over it. Um, we kept saying it's going to be Dre because Dre's better in coverage. Dre's a better tackler. Um, all We things... said that. No, I know. That's Other what I said. We said, said that. that. <laughs> yeah, I said we said that. Um, because we just believe that Dre Greenlaw is a step up from Aziz. It doesn't mean Aziz is the bad player. Uh, he's developed very nice under D'Amico Ryans and this 49ers defense of staff, but... Uh, Dre Greenlaw is a real dude, and I think that if they bring him back on, for another contract, um, he'll reward them with some Pro Bowls, and I think he'll reward them with some great play, and he'll help all pro fed play better. Uh, but what, what he'll do is he'll give D'Amico Ryans and whoever ends up being the defensive coordinator for the rest of his contract uh, the ability to put him in space against guys that most linebackers can't cover. It's not easy to find really good co uh, linebackers in this league, and they hit a gym, and they're not going to want to give up on a gym like uh, Dre Greenlaw that they found in the fifth round uh, without being compensated in a big way. I don't see them getting enough compensation for him. I think he's going to be strapping it up for the 49ers, at least for the 2022 season, um, but I think for the future as well. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't extend him before training camp. Wouldn't be shocked by that either, Ant, and I'm hoping that's going to be the case because I agree. I don't think anyone can give you the value yeah. to make it worth the while to move off of him uh, because as much as I like Aziz Alshair's development, it, it's not Dre Greenlaw. It, it is not what we saw from Dre Greenlaw. It's not even close to what we saw from Dre Greenlaw. In his rookie campaign, and Aziz is not a rookie, Aziz has been here a lot longer uh, than that. Speaking of coaches, Ant, and development, and things of that nature, John Embry, tight ends coach for the 49ers, assistant head coach as well, was fired, but there's a little bit more to it than that. W what are you hearing? What did you see about the situation? Because it sounds like it, he was he didn't want to take a demotion. It seems like there, a demotion was going to be in place. He wasn't going to be the assistant head coach. He didn't want that. I think it comes with a, what did you say, 60% salary decrease? Yeah, basically what happened was Solomon Wilcox uh, from the NFL Network came out and said um, Embry was you know going to be parting ways with the 49ers, um, but then they went to him and asked him to take a 60% you know decrease in salary. The only thing that makes sense, right, is that he was getting a demotion. He was going to lose that, you know, that tag as an you know, assistant head coach, um, and that was not something he was interested in. Uh, so they went ahead and moved on, uh, parted ways, uh, fired, as some people would say. Um, but there's obviously more to this. I don't know how much we'll get from the 49ers. I don't know if they'll explain the reason why John Embry was let go or not. Uh, maybe we'll get a press release. I don't know how much you know how much they're going to talk on this with the personnel matters. Um, but to me, it, it seems like the way Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch handle business, um, that there's a logical explanation for this. And that, you know, they, they were moving in some direction. We don't know what it is yet. I'm sure it'll, it'll be apparent here pretty soon. Um, and we'll get an idea. But yeah, John Embry, tight end coach. So that's how everyone's really going to know him. Um, he's going to be moving on. And of course, he's attributed with helping develop George Kittle. Um, but I mean, I mean, I think there's a lot of good coaches on this team. And I think yeah, as you move forward with any sort of coaching staff, um, coaches are going to go just like players go. Coaches are going to go as you switch scheme or you discover maybe you want more out of a position than what you were getting or you just have philosophical differences. Um, mm -hmm. All those things happen. But for whatever reason, uh, Kyle Shanahan decided that, you know, with with Embry not doing what he wanted, uh, it was time to part ways. Look, um, I've seen a lot of a lot of takes on this. Um, I've seen people who are upset to see him go. I've seen the people talking about, you know, I can't believe we've done this. I can't believe this is happening. This is a guy who developed George Kittle. I've seen a lot of those. I've seen uh, even the crazy, the even crazier takes, man, where they list uh, every coach on the coaching staff and talk about how John Embry is obviously the better coach than all of these people. Um it's it's one of those things where I, I gotta credit Tom. Well, I gotta credit John Embry for the Kittle development because Kittle has developed. However, Charlie Warner, Ross Dwelly. I mean, yes, Charlie Warner has improved, but Charlie Warner has not improved as a pass catcher. 
Ross Dwelly has not gotten any better since his first days here in San Francisco. And we can look at pretty much every other position on the 49ers roster, uh, top to bottom, and there are improvements. Um, no, no one can sit here and say that Daniel Brunskill has regressed. Daniel Brunskill hasn't regressed. Uh, Tom Compton came out of nowhere. Who do we credit that to? Uh, look at the D-line. All 11, 12 guys on the roster this year all contributed in some way, shape, or form. Your linebacking core. Uh, look at look at Demetrius Flanagan Fowles, and from the time we saw the Chicago game to the time we saw the end of the season yeah. and the development there. Uh, people will talk about the secondary being weak. Did y'all forget that Emmanuel Mosley was undrafted? Jason Verrett was coming off of the street and not having played when he developed. Aubrey Thomas going from guy who couldn't get on field and wasn't getting snaps to starting at the end of the season, week 18, and all throughout the playoff run. Uh, Jimmy Ward, who is a... As I referred to it, Ant, I, I went crazy. I went Stephen A. Smith on this. When we first drafted Jimmy Ward and he wasn't playing well, was a bona fide scrub as I was talking about him. And I was so disappointed in that draft pick. Look how far Jimmy Ward has come in his time in San Francisco and during the Kyle Shanahan era. Jaguski Tart as well. Talanoa Hufa. You can go through every other position on the 49ers. Elijah Mitchell. Every other position on the 49ers and see enormous amounts of growth from multiple players at positions, except for the tight end position. I mean, he doesn't have as many guys, right? No, there's I mean, not he, there's he, not he, many guys, obviously. Yeah. But we haven't seen that elevation from his guys other than George Kittle. And here's the thing, Ant. It could have just been George Kittle. George Kittle could have just been that freak, right? That guy that you find that is just he's just that dude. And how did anyone how did everyone miss on this? It's one of those things where it's a sad thing to see. It's a sad thing to watch John go. But there's obviously a plan in place, and we talked about this the other day, right? We mentioned this. Kyle and 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 John w- needed to sit down and talk about the future of the team, what decisions need to be made, what people need to be here. You know, how do we plan and build this thing long term? They obviously feel like they either a haven't gotten what they needed to get out of John Embry in this tight end room, or b wanted to elevate someone else, needed him to to step, you know, take a step back in terms of his roles and responsibilities. And he wasn't willing to do so, and, and that leads and for, basically forces their hand and puts them in a the place where they got to make a decision. Yeah, you're not going to move on from a coach just to move on from a coach. Accurate. Um, there's going to be a, a reason why. Usually, there there's a very distinct reason why. So th- there was a conversation. You have a conversation with all your coaching staff, and then you have to make decisions. Um, there's a possibility more heads could roll. Uh, when whenever you lose like this, you know you start really getting to brass X and and realizing, hey, I need to make some changes. I need some of these players to step up in in areas and. Um, maybe I'm not getting the most out of the coach, or maybe the coach believes um, in a different way of doing it that's different from what you want. And whenever you have, you know, contradictions as far as you know philosophies, um, you can have some some problems on your team. So um, we don't know exactly what it is. I really am hoping to get some sort of press release from the 49ers. Something. Um, the one thing I'll say is John Embry's a good, a very good guy. He's Absolutely. A, he's a good football coach. Um, and I think that everyone in that that organization believes he's a good football coach. But for whatever reason, it's not what they need right now. It's not what they want. And they're deciding to move on. Um, and I'm just going to completely stay away from any of the narratives that I've read. Any of the other things I've done, I'm going to keep it strictly about him as a coach and what he does on the field. And uh, I thought that, you know, overall, I think the players really like him. Um, so I'm sure this is going to be tough on that tight end room, especially George Kittle. I'm sure he's very close with him. Absolutely. Um, but it's something they felt they had to do. And uh, it's unfortunate. You hate to see people lose their jobs uh, and have to move their family, you know, and stuff like that. But hopefully it works out for him. Hopefully he lands in a, a really good location. Cause I think he's a good coach. And I, I definitely think someone will want him 13 years in the league. Um, he's been at a couple different stops. So, yeah. and, and, you know, he's not just a Kyle Shanahan guy. who's only been with Kyle Shanahan. He's been around the league in some different areas in different places. So you have to imagine, um, there's going to be some place. There's going to be some place with a landing spot. It you, could be as simple too, Alex is them wanting to upgrade with a different coach that Kyle Shanahan feels more comfortable with. Also true. Uh, if everyone remembers, Tom Rathman was here, and everyone everyone was like, Tom Rathman's got to be the running back coach. And then Kyle Shannon was like, but I'm bringing Bobby Turner. Um, we can move Tom Rathman to another position, and I love Tom Rathman. He's a good dude. But, I mean, it could be as simple as that. Maybe someone became available. You're looking to upgrade your team at every area. Maybe you're looking to upgrade your coaching staff at every area as well. Very true, and there could be a guy out there that you know Kyle thinks is going to be a better fit for his scheme and what he wants to do with his tight ends going forward. Um, we're going to see. Uh, but that's not the only coaching move that happened for the 49ers as well. Uh, Butch Berry now has become the, well, I think it's the O-line coach for the Broncos. It is, I'm, yeah. If I'm O-line not mistaken. Coach. So the Niners have essentially in a day ant of news breaking. And, you know, we weren't expect this was not an episode we were planning to do. Like we were planning on having face off for, for Thursday. And now face off, he's getting pushed to Friday uh, because with all this information and news, 
Um, yeah, Butch Berry is now the new O-line coach for the Denver Broncos. Um, he's replacing Mike Munchak because I think Munchak went to the Packers, I believe. Yeah, you have the you have some changes because you have a coaching staff change. Um, so now you have uh, Neil Hackett looking to bring in, or Nathaniel Hackett, I'm sorry, looking to bring in you know his coaches. So it makes sense, right? The Green Bay offense is very similar to what you're gonna what the San Francisco 49ers run. Um, so bringing in Barry makes a lot of sense. Assistant offensive line coach here with for Chris Forrester. Yeah, you plug and play. I mean, that's what they want to do. They want to do similar things. Um, so he's gonna know exactly how to run the scheme. This is this is normal football things. It's a it's a nice you know improvement for him as he gets a you know a nice promotion to the head you know head offensive line coach. Um, so the foreigners have had change in their offensive line now for a couple years in a row. With you know we had uh, we had the, our offensive line coach go to New, uh, New York the year before. True. Um, and then now you have you know Chris Forrester kind of was the assistant before that, and he he took over, and now you have his assistant going. Um, this is something that's going to happen to Kyle Shanahan's um, coaching staff for a long time, but this what? is expected. I mean, it's stunning, man. It's it's almost like you know when you have a a good scheme in place, you get a good system. You know, a good foundation, an organization that's continuing to have success and overcoming adversity. Um, your your coaches tend tend to be commodities as well because they understand that foundation, how it was laid, what it took to get there. Um, and uh, Barry is someone who spent time with the Packers and with the Niners. So again, two systems, two teams with similar philosophies and ideas of of offense and how they want their O line to play. Um, you know, two teams that have had a lot of success over the last three years. And uh, now he's the head O line coach for a team that has hired the Packers O coordinator and is, you know, going to be in implementing and installing a very similar system. So we'll see. We'll see what this means uh, for the Niners and O line and what they're what Coach Forrester is going to do with the with the new assistant because they're going to have to promote someone and get him some help there. Um, a lot of decisions to be made with the coaching staff. Um, this wasn't a heads roll situation, Ant, uh, but I imagine there's going to be a lot of turnover for the 49ers. There's also going to be a lot of turnover for the Rams as well because both of the both of their coordinators are also dealing with some uh, interviews as well and maybe getting some head coaching jobs and opportunities. And we're still waiting to find out what's going to happen with Mike McDaniel. Yeah, because if Mike McDaniel goes to Miami, you're Someone's probably going to lose a couple assistants with him. Um, and who those are, we don't know. You know, um, possibly Wes Welker. You know, we'll have to keep an eye on that. You know, you, he could easily oh my go gosh, over there and yeah. become offensive coordinator. I could see um, that. So there's going to be some people to watch. Uh, but, you know, this is just what happens. Usually Kyle Shanahan agrees with these coaches, you know, which guys to take, and they make an agreement. Like Robert Sala, you know, he took over the floor with him. Um, and then he took John Benton, the offensive line coach. So um, I'm sure they'll work out something with McDaniel. He wants to see McDaniel do good. Uh, ultimately, though, hopefully McDaniel comes back for one more year and, and goes with the D'Amico Ryan's type, uh, you know, way to handle it. Let me get some more development. Yeah, more development. Uh, Mike McDaniel is perfectly capable of handling it, but I would just love to have him back. And just give me one more. Give me one more year of Corky Mike. Just please. Uh, I'll be okay. honest. I'll, I'll still want him the next year after that. So I'm not going to sit here and clamor for one more year when I know ultimately I'll want one more after that and one more after that. And, and another one after that, too. Yeah, he's a good right. coach. And I, I, love, only one, there's only one I thing, love his pressers. Hey, there's only one thing better than one more year of Mike McDaniels. It's two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But look, the Niners also made some future signings, and it brought in some some players on future reserve contracts. Defensive lineman Alex Barrett, offensive lineman Alfredo Pasta Man Gutierrez, <laughs> fullback Josh Hockett, cornerback Kader Holman, tight end Tanner Hudson, wide receiver Keyshawn Johnson, which we all know about, wide receiver Austin Mack, tight end Jordan Matthews, linebacker Curtis Robinson, defensive lineman Chris Slayton, and wide receiver Connor Weddington. Um, any names on that list? surprise you because the first the first three no shocks jordan matthews not a shock to me at all um but a lot of these other names i mean there's there's not a whole lot of like you know buzz around any of these guys any of those names surprise you no i think pretty much all of them were on the practice squad besides a couple of guys um the niners are working on filling out their 90-man roster already and one of the ways you do it is sign these guys to the future contracts and then these guys are, you know, are, are exclusive to you and you have them locked up. Usually they're from your practice squad or from another, from another practice squad. Um, so that's what it's about now. The 49ers are doing that. Um, none of these salar none of these salaries count until the, the new league year starts. So Correct. Um, we can still see some movement with the future contracts. But I do like Jordan Matthews staying with the football team. I want to see what his development has been at tight end because the key for him is not about receiving. It's about blocking. Uh, if he can get his blocking, you know, up to where it needs to be, maybe he could benefit the team next year. You know, maybe they do move on from Lost Willie and Jordan Matthews is the third tight end. If he can be that receiving threat that we're looking for to, you know, back up George Kittle, you know, Charlie Warner as the, you know, the the blocking tight end, um, maybe you have another weapon there. We'll see what his development is like. Um, maybe a new tight end coach also will help that way. We'll see. Uh, but I thought he was an interesting name. And then um, besides that, you've seen like the usual suspects, you know, um, 
Of course, Alex Barrett, I do like him, so I like having him around just in case. Fan. Um, because I think, yeah, he's a guy that's been able to put pressure on the edge, you know, at times. So he's a nice fallback plan if you need. Absolutely. I don't don't hate it. Um nothing there that's shocked me or surprised me. Um I think the the pleasant surprise was seeing Jordan Matthews' name in the in the mix with everybody because I think you and I both like him and and where his development was throughout the year and a guy who's been on the practice squad for most of the year and you know, back and forth. Um, similar to Dante Johnson, it seems like Jordan Matthews will be around the 49ers organization for some time until he decides he's no longer playing anymore or isn't on another football team. Uh, so we'll see, Ant. Um, and you had mentioned, uh, you know, he was around the football team. You weren't talking about the Washington football team nor the Washington Commanders. You were talking about uh, this this football team, the 49ers. Thing is, this is the, the 49ers cutback. Yeah, definitely. That's what I was referring to. And I'll probably just refer to them as Washington forever. Um, because Who wants to call them the Commanders? Yeah, it's it's an interesting name. Or as, interesting their, name as their loving nickname is being known. I'm not going to say it. All right, yeah. Anyway, let's move on from that, Ant. Let's move on from right. that Washington football team and their still pretty crappy FedEx field over there uh, to talk about Jimmy Garoppolo. Not is Jimmy Garoppolo staying? Is Jimmy Garoppolo going? We're all like 99.9999999% positive that Jimmy Garoppolo is being it's traded. A nines. It's a lot of nines. Um, it's not 100% guaranteed because anything could happen or you may not get the value you want. But that was a question Lou asked yesterday in, in the chat on, on the video was, what is Jimmy G's trade value? And no homerism. He wanted no homerism, man. He wanted just... He believes even from himself, too. You know, I mean... He wants honesty. Take the homer out of the situation, yeah. right? And just be be as honest as we can about this. Jimmy G's trade value. It's It's funny. You and I, a lot of times we say stuff and we're like, yeah, I agree. Or yeah, I think it's the same. You and I pre-show talked about this. I said mine. And as the words were coming out of my mouth, you're like, that's exactly what I'm thinking as well. Yeah. Uh, what is the number that we're both kind of on where Jimmy G's trade value um, that we think is the, the most realistic possibility for what the Niners could get for him? I think the first thing is to look at the high end, right? I think everyone would love to have a first round pick. I don't think first round pick is something that's um, realistic. Do you want to su- if you got to a Super Bowl, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't think first round pick is realistic. So let's throw that off the table. Um, I do believe a second round pick is what the 49ers are looking for. They're looking for something second. But we've seen with the the way that veteran quarterbacks have been traded in the past that there's going to be a kicker in there as well. There's going to be another pick. It's not just going to be Jimmy Garoppolo for a second round pick, which is the value they got from New England. But when he got it from New England, he had no starts under his belt. He had no Super Bowl appearances. He had no, you know, 36, you know, wins. He he wasn't, you know, winning at 69% rate. He had like four wins. Yeah. It was diff- It was like two, I think. I think you're um, right. It was two. It, it's hurt. just a different category that he was in at the time. So I think there's going to be a kicker. Um, and me and you believe that a second and a fourth is pretty much what Jimmy Garoppolo's value is. A second and a fifth is also something I believe is realistic for Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, just will a team be willing to do that? I know that there, there's been talk about, oh, maybe they'll throw in a player, but then you got to work out the player's salary. And oh, part of the oh reason that you're trading that. Jimmy Garoppolo is for the dump, the salary dump, um, to get him you know, out of the way. And then you are you have that money free to be able to build your roster. I mean, I'm sure if a team came through with like a very solid player that you really loved, um, yeah, you could think about it. But I don't think anyone's going to be willing to throw you know one of their blue chip players in a deal for Jimmy Garoppolo. And if they do... Um, will it just be a player for player? You won't probably be able to get any trade, you know, or any uh, draft picks back, which is ultimately what I think they're trying to do here. I don't want a player for player. I don't want a pick and a player. I'd rather take two picks. The big thing for me here is the dump, the salary dump. That's the most important thing. Um, the whole point of moving off of Jimmy Garoppolo is because, number one, um, you drafted a guy behind him. You spent some capital in order to accomplish it. Um, but number two, you did that because you were going to be coming up on the cap. And barring Jimmy Garoppolo getting you to a Super Bowl or winning a Super Bowl, there wasn't going to be room for him on this roster next year. You didn't get there. You got close, but you didn't get there. So now you have this young guy. You can make the decision to go with him, or you can find another quarterback out there in the ether to, to roll with for another year to try and bridge. And there's tons of options, and we'll talk about that down the road. But the reality of the situation is, is that you wanted to free up that $25 million. Bringing up that $25, $26 million, getting one pick back, the, the same pick you gave up, and then getting a, a player back in return just eats into that money. You have a lot of players to re-sign. A lot of pieces still that you need to do. A lot of guys you want to try and bring back in. There's free agents that you still want to target. Um, unless you get to hand-pick the player that you want to get back in return or it's a player that you absolutely love that you think is going to change the team, I don't see that happening. 
I see a team getting rid of a, a veteran piece that's a little bit of a salary dump as well for them to maybe free up the money to make it a little bit more digestible for them to bring in Jimmy Garoppolo if that's the case. That's not the best situation for the 49ers. The best situation is a situation in which you get a second and a fourth, a second and a fifth, like you talked about. Um, we've even seen a report of a, a third, fourth, and a sixth. Um, from, from Maybe that, that would be an option for the Niners. Um, if I have a choice between a third, fourth, and a sixth and like a third-round pick and a player, like give me the third, fourth, and the sixth before that. Uh, but any team that's willing to give up a second-round pick at this point is, is going to be your most ideal situation. for them. Um, you know, Getting back what you got for Jimmy, but also getting back something that's a little bit closer to what you gave up to Trey Lance this year. I mean, you gave up a second round pick, essentially what is this year's pick. Um, it's pick 29, right? It's pick 29 in the draft. And if you're able to trade him to a team like the Texans who finished near the bottom of the barrel, if you're able to trade him to one of these teams that did really poorly, that could use a veteran quarterback in the mix, you're talking about what an eight or nine pick difference from when their second round pick is to when your pick 29 is. That's a win. If you're the 49ers, I'm a little less bullish about getting a player back. Um, I think it all depends on the player. Uh, I, I think that you're looking to get the most value. So if you believe, like, say a team is willing to send you a second and a fifth, but they say, you know what, instead of sending a second and a fifth, we'll send you a second and this player, and you believe that player's value is above a fifth-round pick, go with the proven commodity in that in True. that situation. True. Um, I don't know exactly who that player would be. You know, and that's I, the problem. Yeah, and you don't you don't know you know if it, if it's the Steelers, you know you they've got appealing players. Um, if it's the Texans, they got appealing players. Um, so you it depends on where you want to attack and what Kyle Shanahan wants to do with his players. Um, but I think that that there is something there. It could be a player, but I think that in all reality, it's probably going to be two picks. Right, let me ask you something. In a crazy world, and this is a hundred percent Homer. If, Sorry, if you're Lou. talking Pittsburgh right now, yeah, I am. Don't do it to me. Chase Claypool and a fifth. Yeah, I'm making the deal, 100%. I know Chase Claypool has his issues, but I'm instituting him into a locker room of San Francisco 49ers, the way they handle business. And if I can take a positionless player like Chase Claypool and add him to this wide receiver group with Trey freaking Lance every day. Every day. Is there any way that that could is that is there any way that that's even possible? It all depends on his attitude, right? It has to be that. I if, wouldn't think so. I would see I would I would imagine that this would be a non-starter like if if Pittsburgh was like, hey, we're interested with Jimmy Garoppolo. And Kyle Shanahan goes, Shanahan goes, Shanahan goes, there's only one way you're getting Jimmy Garoppolo, and that's a package with Chase Claypool in it. We'll take a less of a draft pick if you're going to give us Chase Claypool. I would imagine Mike Tomlin would Tomlin would hang up the phone. Like that would be like a nope, that's a non-starter. But with everything that's happened with Pittsburgh, right. all the crazy drama, all the issues at the wide receiver position that they've had over the years, maybe? I mean, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know what, how they value Chase Claypool. We only know how I value Chase Claypool. I know how I value Chase yeah. Claypool as well. Um, so, so that's why, yeah. I mean, that had crossed my mind, of course, because, I, but you, this is this is not Madden. Um, so the reality of that happening are are not great. Um, and also, hey, no spoiling anything Kyle, for the playthrough. <laughs> Kyle Shanahan would have had to, um, you know, he'd have to be really high on Chase Claypool. Uh, I think that Claypool does provide a lot of opportunities, but. I think when we're talking about it, I think it is realistically a Jimmy Garoppolo um, for a second and a fourth or fifth or even a third, you know, like we're talking about third, fourth and six, something like that. Uh, that kind of goes with the tea leaves. And those are realistic expectations, you know, for what the 49ers should gather for Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, it could even be less, but I think that there is a market for him. And whenever you have teams that are actually bidding against each other, that's a good situation. You're going to get a little bit more value than you thought you would um, before. Also, um, the fact that his salary is really not that crazy. I mean, $25 million against the cap um, is not very big for a team taking him on, not compared to some of the other players. And if they believe that they're a player away, um, there you go. But that could also offset if they do make a player trade. It offsets some of the trade, uh, some of the, the money impact that they are going to incur by having Jimmy Grubb. Agreed. And a couple of Steelers podcasters and beat writers, as I'm seeing right now, Ant, have already started floating this out there. Should the Pittsburgh Steelers be open to trade Chase Claypool, possibly target guys like Miles, Jack, or others? So it is being discussed. It is a possibility that's out there in the ether. We'll see what happens. And you just threw out Miles, Jack, and we talked about Drake Greenlaw with the ESPN thing. Um, if it gets real creative, yeah. But I don't want to lose Drake Greenlaw. I'm just saying, when you brought up Miles, Jack, um, the one thing I'll say about Miles, Jack, he's a very talented player. Drake Greenlaw is 100 times better as a linebacker than Miles, Jack. Correct. Miles Jack's a good a good athlete, but he's great not a athlete. great linebacker right now. No, he's still developing. He's developing, which is crazy because he's been in the league for a while. 
Um, in college, he was a tremendous player. Could play running back. Could play linebacker. He could do it all. Literally. Um, he just hasn't developed with Jacksonville. Some of it could be Jacksonville. Uh, I mean, I would imagine head coaching turnover, constant shifting of of personnel, GM, philosophy, scheme. I, yeah, can't help. It, it definitely can't help him. Uh, but I also wanted to go over before we wrap up the episode and betting favorites and betting odds for all you betters out there that love to bet on where Jimmy Garoppolo ends up and where most likely he's going to be the week one starter. Uh. The team with the worst odds right now of of trade target teams in the Indianapolis Colts, followed by the Cleveland Browns, uh, plus sixteen hundred for the Colts, plus fourteen hundred for the Browns. The Vegas Raiders sitting at plus fourteen hundred. Houston Texans ant sitting at plus twelve hundred. That that surprised me a little bit because of the uncertainty with the quarterback situation. I figured that would have been up a little higher. And, well, and you got Josh McDaniels in, with the Raiders, uh, number one. There's very familiar uh, familiar with him. And then also you got Chris Casario as running the organization for the Texans True. who came from New England. Mm-hmm. Um, you would think both of them would be... Two guys very familiar with Jimmy. Yeah, I think I think all you got is the Mills thing, and then you've got, of course, Derek Carr um, are the interesting ones. But I wouldn't be surprised the Raiders don't move off Derek. I would be a little surprised as well. The Green Bay Packers sitting at plus 1,200. The Carolina Panthers, Ant, now you're starting to get into the the, the teams that are under that plus you know 100, uh, plus 1,000 mark. Carolina Panthers sitting at plus 750. The Miami Dolphins sitting at plus 750. And I imagine those odds would drastically change and go up a little bit more or go down a little bit more if Mike McDaniels were to end up becoming the head coach there. Shockingly enough, after that, it's the San Francisco 49ers at plus 650. Yeah. The Broncos at plus 650. The Bucks at plus 600. The Washington Commander sitting at plus 450. And the Pittsburgh Steelers with the best odds of landing Jimmy Garoppolo at plus 325. I think those ones make sense. I mean, especially the you know the last five that you said. Um, Tampa Bay is definitely in need of a quarterback. Jimmy Garoppolo has similar characteristics to what Tom Brady had as far as um, he came from the same system, so he's going to understand what to do there. I think they have a veteran team and are looking for a veteran quarterback. They're not going to want to roll with someone young. Um, with the commanders, they've been searching for a quarterback for a while, uh, so so he would make sense there. Um, I think the under-the-radar one that, yeah, everyone should pay attention to is the Denver Broncos. Uh, because you have Nathaniel Hackett coming in there, and he's going to be running a similar offense to what you see um, in Green Bay. And so you're going to want a quarterback that can go in there and run it, and Jimmy Garoppolo can go run it. Team with a really good defense also already in place, and Team with a good defense and a team with a running game, uh, and, that, and that's what you're going to build it around. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it'll be interesting. The one question you have is about Jimmy Garoppolo throwing the football in Denver and playing in the cold temperatures True. and mile high, or, yeah, mile high um, elevation. Yep. Um, we'll see. Um, but I think that there's definitely a – Pecking order, and then there are teams that are going to be out there looking for Jimmy. Um, and I, I read on Twitter earlier, and I don't know how how good it is, but yeah, that that Pittsburgh, um, Washington, and Denver were very interested in Jimmy Garoppolo. Doesn't surprise me at all in the slightest stance. I'm not I'm not shocked by that at all. We'll see what happens. Uh, it could end up becoming a bidding war for Jimmy Garoppolo, which is a positive thing for the 49ers Huge, yeah. because you got to imagine that's going to elevate and inflate some of those draft picks, or maybe the players are going to give up, and hopefully it's Chase Claypool. Cut back crew. Let us know what you thought about all of this yeah. down below in the comments section right now. What is your preferred trade target for Jimmy Garoppolo and your non-homer, non-biased opinion about what his trade value actually is? We want to hear from you down there in the comment section. And while you're doing that, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and hit that notification bell. Become the newest member of the Cutback Crew. You've got Friday, an incredible heated discussion. Not not super heated, but somewhat heated with Jay Hill on 49ers face off. Me and him going at it. Ant keeping things together over here and keeping the ship afloat and driving in the right direction. And then starting on Saturday, you're going to be having free agent content. We're going to be breaking down all of the free agents for the 49ers, which guys are most likely to be resigned, how we think the 49ers are going to get it done. And we're going to go position by position. All of the guys the Niners have the options for from this team to bring back and resign uh, for the 2022 season. Yeah, exactly. We're going to start, you know, breaking down which players um the foreigners look to retain and it's a, it's an interesting conversation, but you have to start with your own team first before we start getting out there, you know, into the guys they could target from other teams that are going to be free agents. Um it's all about the 49ers right now. We got to keep it close um and really go over these guys. It's going to be interesting though because it, there's a lot of um interesting free agents for the 49ers and how the 49ers are able to manage the cap and also bring back the players <clears throat> that they want to bring back. Um it's going to take some work. Uh, the front office uh, has got it all they can handle, and I think we got some interesting takes on some of it as well. You, you know that's right, Ant. We definitely do. But Cutback Crew, we'll see you tonight, Thursday, for a nice live stream. 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the schedule, what we got coming up, what the offseason schedule is going to look like, content's going to look like, etc. So we'll have a lot of fun. We'll take some Q&A from you. We'll see you tonight, 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. And until that time, stay safe. Remember the right way is always the 49ers way.